hard to believe that it's been 50 years since four young Swedes, Benny, Bjorn, and Yetta and Anna Fried, called themselves ABBA, won the Eurovision Song Contest with their song Waterloo and hit the airwaves of the world. Now the Super Troopers' huge success is the subject of a new book by best-selling author Giles Smith, who takes a deep dive through their greatest hits and game-changing music. I got to chat with him about ABBA through the ages. Giles, thank you for talking to us. It's a big task to take on any book, um, especially one about uh, a group like this. What, what drew you to ABBA? Um, I think it was the thought that, uh, you know, here we are 50 years on from Eurovision 1974 when they first came into our, uh, into our lives. And we're just thinking about the fact that this music has been around for half a century now, but also the point that for 42 of those years, the band hadn't really existed. Um, they stopped doing what they do in 1982. Um, they never formally split up, but they simply stopped recording and stopped touring, and that was kind of it. And it struck me that that was really slightly unusual, that there'd be these 42 years in which the band would basically sit at home doing nothing, and meanwhile their music would get stronger and stronger and seep further and further into the culture and become more and more popular. I mean, I think it's probably true to say they're more popular now than they've ever been. Yeah, well, they were almost sort of ridiculed as a little harsh, but, you know, they were sort of much maligned for a, a, an amount of time, weren't they? They certainly were, and I don't, th I don't think ridicule is harsh at all, actually, Richard. I, I think they really were. Um, you know, the first thing that Clive James said about them when he reviewed Eurovision was that they were um, incurably, uh, incurably trivial. It didn't help them that they were Eurovision Song Contest winners at the time. <laughs> I think they really spent a lot of their career trying to shake that off. It was it was an albatross rather than, I mean, it, on the one hand, it shot them to fame, and that's how we all came to know them. But on the other hand, they kind of had to live it down because people were used to thinking of the Eurovision Song Contest winners as one-hit wonders. The songs were so magnificently crafted as pure pop songs and the lyrics so simple and we, we need to remember that English is not their first language which, which explains gimme 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 uh, money 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 etc so it was that simplicity I think and the perfect pop sensibility so I'm sure you'd agree with that yeah completely the way that as you get older with those songs they start to mean other things to you you know listening to Dancing Queen when you're a teenager was one kind of experience but then hearing it again in your 30s and your 40s and your 50s, it just becomes a different thing. And that's one of the ways in which the band and their music have been able to survive. Australia, of course, played quite a role. They toured here back in the day, and Muriel's Wedding and uh, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, I would think, played a, a, a role in the resurgence. Do you agree with that? Yeah, completely. I mean, I, I think I can say this on your show and, you know, with no one listening over my shoulder, but I think Australia has the big claim to be ABBA's second home. The Beatlemania thing that kind of happened for them when they came to Australia in the 70s with the screaming in the streets and the mobbing them at their hotels, that happened for them in, in Australia in a way that it didn't happen for them anywhere else in the world, I think. It's also the case that um, without pressure from the Australian record label, I don't think Mamma Mia would ever have been a single. They had no plans to release that track off the album. But RCA in Australia said, that, you know, this is getting a really big response here. Let's, let's put it out. Mamma Mia. Now with the Voyage show, uh, which is going to come to Australia, and the success of Mamma Mia, I mean, as you say, they are bigger now than than, than ever. Yeah, certainly, um, and, and bigger in sort of interesting ways. And in you know, the, the, the Mamma Mia musical and the two films introduced them to a, a whole new generation. You know, my kids are word perfect in ABBA songs, but it's not because they really know ABBA; it's because they know those those movie versions. 
Um, and it's also interesting if you look on Spotify, some of the um, soundtrack versions of the songs from the Mamma Mia movies have streamed many millions more times now than the ABBA versions themselves. They, they went away in the 80s and they came back through various beats in the 90s, these films through the musical. Um, and now I think it's the case that whereas in the 70s you might have said they were kind of a band for kids and for kids' parents and nothing much in between and nothing much beyond, now I think they just seem to be a band for everybody all the way across. Final question, favourite song? Well, it moves about a bit, Richard. I think probably <laughs> knowing me, knowing you, I, I've always thought that was just a really perfect pop song, and, uh, and I still do. What about you? The winner takes it all, no contest. What a lovely man he is. I, I really enjoyed talking to him. Giles Smith, uh, who's written ABBA Through the Ages. It's out at all good bookstores, probably a few dodgy ones as well. But um, <laughs> it's, if you're a fan, he dissects the songs. He's really good. He yeah. explains it very clearly, he's, doesn't he? He's, it's a great read. It's a great subject. Yeah. Love it. The winner great takes chart. it all, really. Oh, yeah. Get, well, does that get you going, Dickie? The winner takes I love that song. Yeah, it's a pump up song. Yeah. When you're on the treadmill, pump it up to 14, off oh, he goes. Off he goes, eh? Thank you, Dickie.